Uh, Debbie, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, good evening and thank you for coming here. As you may have guessed from my surname and soon from my accent, I'm Italian. And uh, in fact, uh, that's where I come from, in the middle of Tuscany, a city called Siena, many of you may or may not know, is famous for two things. One, to be the cradle of the new or the modern Italian language, and most important, for a horse race which takes place twice a year in the main square. Now, this is uh, something which is starting during the Renaissance, when my ancestors thought that rather than slaughter each other, it would be much easier to actually solve all their disagreement with a race. Now, after various hours of pageantry, uh, there is no audio, otherwise you will hear 50,000 people screaming. There is a race which takes only one and a half minutes, three laps around, everything is allowed, including bribery, including Italian style. And the important winner is not the rider, it's the horse. So if the horse gets there fast, that's all the matter. And some rider, as you would see in a minute, the blue guys will deliberately fall off in the hopes that the horse being lighter will be able to win the race. Here you are. It's a very serious affair, and as I said, a very civilized way to resolve issues. So that's where I come from. Having come from uh, uh, Tuscany, from Siena, as I said, the cradle of the modern Italian language, I like to believe that this gentleman, Leonardo, is one of my ancestors. As a matter of fact, uh, he's one of the first guys who described the anatomy of the heart and, in fact, the function of the valve of the heart. All these manuscripts are now property of the Royal College, Royal Collection Trust in Windsor, and, in fact, it belonged to the Queen of the States, here depicted by another uh, famous Italian painter, Anigoni. Right. Having said all of this, uh, let me tell you something a little bit about me. In Italy, nobody grows up wanting to be a train driver. We all want to be either a, a racing car driver or a jet fight pilot. I think I settled for something a little less. I wanted to fly this, and I wanted to be an airline pilot. So I enrolled into a mechanical engineering course, and as I was towards the end of it, I had a little problem with one of my eyes, the left eyes. Nothing serious, but it, it required to remove a little piece of dust, and then it was patched up. And as it was patched up, I realized I couldn't see anything from the right eyes. Now, to cut a long story short, it turned out that I got a congenital abnormality, which is called amblyopia, which again, to keep it simple, it means I've only got one eye, or so one good eye. Now, as you can appreciate, I usually don't broadcast this to my patients, <laughs> um, particularly before the surgery. But uh, my uh, career as an airline pilot was over even before I started. So now in Italy, uh, we say, if you can't be an engineer, which your parents will regard the pinnacle of ambition for, for, for your children, why don't you try to be a doctor? Because you don't need a great deal of intellect, and it's a much easier uh, state of affair. So this is what I embark on, and eventually, when I train as a heart surgeon, I realize that really, cardiac surgery is just plumbing, straightforward plumbing, as I will show you in a minute. So this is what happened more or less every day of my week. Now, this is a coronary artery from somebody who died. Uh, of acute death, he never even made it to the hospital. If you look at this, the white bit is where the blood will run and bring oxygen to the heart. The rest is what we call furring or hardening or atherosclerosis. Now, if this patient hadn't died suddenly, he would have come to the hospital, probably complained of some pain in his chest, angina, he would have been seen by a cardiology, he would have some test. One particular test is called an angiogram, which injects some dye in the coronary. And as you can see here, there is an absolute 100% blockage. So that patient possibly would have been referred to me, and all I would do is what we call a bypass operation. A bypass operation is a simple affair 
where you jump the narrowing. So you take a piece of tube from somewhere in the body, either a vein from a leg, something from the arm, and you jump the narrowing. And as long as you get it right, it's, it works pretty well. As you can see, you can bring a lot of blood to the area which weren't getting it before. Now, this is a relatively, in terms of surgery, new operation, because really, it, it became routine in the middle 80. And in fact, when I started as a young trainee, the mortality from this operation was astronomical. Uh, one in four patients who die, 25%. So it, it was no joke. Now, if you look at it, it's less than 2%. And if you like, if you allow me to do a little bit of advertising, this is the last national data available on more than 4,000 operations performed at the Bristol Heart Institute. We had a survival in excess of 98%. And I always use the joke, if you had this kind of odds, when you play the lottery, you win every weekend. Of course, it's not just a matter of surviving. It's also a matter of quality of life. And the quality of life is undoubtedly improved by this operation, and this is probably my best customer, Sir Ronald Fine, who after two cardiac arrests when boarding a plane in uh, Bristol Airport, had an emergency operation, and eight weeks after, despite of my negative advice, he ran seven marathons in seven days in seven different continents and raised a couple of million pounds for the British Heart Foundation. So going back, if you excuse me a little bit to me, uh, I then went to medical school. And the medical school was in my hometown, Siena. And this was the medical school. And until 20 years ago, it was actually the main city hospital. It's now a famous uh, museum. And this very room, which you can see with some of the most beautiful paintings from the Renaissance period, was actually the surgical world. So as a, uh, as a junior, or in fact, as a medical student, when I was doing the intern in surgery, my main duty was to talk to the patient as they wake up from the anesthesia and convince them that they were still in the land of the living. <laughs> because the majority staring at the ceiling so are gone to heaven. Now, uh, some were disappointed because the one who thought they would never get to heaven, they thought I had a stroke of luck, but that, that was it. So I did my medical school and almost after I qualified, I came to this country. It's a long story for another time. Uh, but uh, after some time in London and a few other places, I ended up in what my wife called the promised land. You may have understood that my wife is Welsh. And there, really, it was where I did the bulk of my training. And there, as a very young guy, very full of enthusiasm, I met somebody who had a profound effect on my future career and my way of thinking. And this is Andrew Anderson. He was then the, professor, the British Heart Foundation professor of cardiology. He sadly died a year ago of old age. And this was the man who really influenced me most. And I went to see him, as, as I, uh, and I said, um, Sir, I want to be a heart surgeon, but most important, I want to be involved in research. I want to be an academic. And he said to me very simply, no, no, no. You cannot be involved in research. You have to be committed. And this is what he gave me. He said, think to the difference between being committed and involved. Thinks of a plate of ham and egg, the hen is involved, the pig is committed. <laughs> and that was like something which more or less is always stays with me ever since. But he also told me something even more profound. And he said, well, you heart surgeon who are regarded as at the top of the uh, food chain, I'm afraid you are affected by two very serious syndromes. One is delusion. You think you are more important than you effectively are. And the other one, I'm afraid, is denial. And this is even more serious affair. And the reason is because you think you are doing something fantastic. OK, you save a few lives. But all you do is just patching up people. And as you do this patching up, you actually do also a lot of damage, which at that time, it, it was a serious issue. 
And he points out to me two particular aspects of what we do in the operating theater. And he said, and I'll explain to you a little bit because most of you are not medics, when you operate on the heart, the first thing is you have to connect the patient to a machine which is called the heart and lung because it does the work of the heart and the lung. So you, put, you, you, you open the chest of the patient, this is the heart, and you put lots of tubes inside the heart. And all he does, the machine, he drain the blood out into the machine, he fill it up with oxygen, and then he push it back into the patient. In this way, you can stop the heart, and you can work on a heart which is not moving and is devoid of blood. And he said to me, well, these are the two main problems, because this machine is not very natural, and it mints all the blood cells, like a mincing machine. And when you stop the heart, you got the problem that uh, you have to restart it, and you can damage the heart by starving it of oxygen. So as a result of this, I start thinking to the whole lot of these two problems. He gave me the, uh, how can I say, the start of what the problem were. And the famous observation which I made were relatively simple. The first things I said, well, this is a grown-up man, this is a child, this is the heart of a child, as you can see, is pretty small eh, compared with this one. So I realized that what we were doing in children was identical to what we were doing in adults. It was just an uncritical extrapolation. If it works for a grown-up guy, it's going to work even for a child, which doesn't make a lot of sense. But that was the way it was. And most important, this was the main things. Everything, we were obsessed by cold. Everything was kept cold. We had to cool the body of this patient up to 25, 28 degrees. And we had also to stop the heart using cold solution. Now, this is all fairly well because it's like hibernation, right? If you cool down somebody, you don't need too much oxygen. But it, of course, first you have to cool them, and then after you finish cooling, you have to rewarm them, which is like slowly cooking them, which was doing rather a lot of damage. So with my next slides, I'm going to summarize 15 years or more research, which is we went from something like this to something like this, which I much prefer it. Uh, so <laughs> effectively, we, we went to what it was called hypothermia into normothermia. So most of the operations are now routinely done, including children, using normothermia. So we stay at normal temperature, and even the heart, we protect the heart using warm solution rather than cold solution. Now, in the meantime, I had been trained uh, reasonably well, and, uh, in, uh, the, uh, and after traveling various parts of, the, the, of Europe for training, additional training, uh, I ended up in Bristol at the end of 1992, and this is me, as you can see, and the BHF decided to give me a chair of heart surgery, and now I can't afford a, a, a jacket and a tie and everything else. The main question at that time, which I was really interested in, was, are some operation to the heart when we can get rid of completely of the heart-lung machine? And this is what we embark on. Now, at that time, there was also uh, a lot of talking about keyhole surgery. The general surgeon were doing operation, like removing a gallbladder through a keyhole. So we as heart surgeons, which we like to believe we are much higher than general surgeon, we couldn't possibly accept that. We had to find a way to do this operation through keyholes. And the reason is, when we do a heart operation, we make a, a rather large cut in the middle of the breastbone. Whereas, could we do an operation through a small hole? As often happened, two school of thought developed. One was the American. Now, the American have always got a lot of money, and they do everything incredibly complicated. So what they suggested was, this is a patient having an operation. Instead of cutting in the middle of this breastbone, we will attach the patient to the machine through a cut in the groin. In the groin, you can find an artery and a vein. We then put some more tube in the neck, some in the chest, and when we got the patient more or less impaled, we do an operation through a small hole, which didn't sound too clever to me, but that's the way it is. And they even took it a step further. And they suggested that we are going to do this operation with a robot. Now, I have to make a premises here. 
robot works in a lot of kind of surgery, particularly urology and some general surgery and so forth. In heart surgery, it's a disaster. And in fact, there is hardly anybody using this. As you can see, it's pretty impressive, but it's equally pretty frightening. And the reason, I think, why this was developed at that time was very simple. Instead of saying, we got a problem, let's try to find a solution, they had the solution. And the solution was very much derived from space explorations. So they wanted to find an application to make some money. And what better than heart surgery, which is usually quite an expensive kind of surgery. Now, uh, I was in Bristol. This was 1993. And first of all, nobody was going to buy me a robot anyway, because it cost a million pounds. And then you need another half a million pounds to maintain it every year. But also, I'm, I'm a strong believer that surgery, at the end of the day, is a craft. And I'm also a strong believer in keeping things simple. So going back to my slight obsession with aeroplane, I was fortunate to come almost ironical. I ended up in Bristol where Concorde was developed. And of course, I had the fortune, they would say they didn't have the fortune of several people to be operated by me who actually were involved with the development of Concorde. And I remember one of these giving me a picture or something which apparently was in their shed where the development was taking place. And this was a writing on the main wall which said, keep it simple, what does not go into an aircraft cannot go wrong. I thought this was brilliant. It's probably the best things I've ever seen. And it's really uh, uh, an indictment to uh, what I've been trying to say over the years. If you keep it simple, if you use the surgeon's skill, and you have to have some skill, it will all be easy and possibly even better for patients. So what we did, and forgive me about this, but I'll try to keep it simple. We, we realized that if you open, uh, behind the breastbone of everybody, there are two arteries, which are called the mammary artery. So the, our plan was, if instead of making a big cut in the middle of the chest, we go in between the ribs, making a small incision, we can then find this artery, which we can use as a bypass graft, and we can attach it to one of the main coronary in the heart. It did work, and it works because it allowed us to do also something else. For the first time, we could do this with the heart moving. So we did not need any heart-lung machine. Now, the problem with this operation, this is my second patient. Actually, he authorized me to show the pictures, uh, it, which is quite relevant, perhaps, for the debate later on. Uh, you have to start somebody sometime with one patient, so who is the first one to volunteer? But we realized that doing this operation, there was a main limitation. We could do one bypass graft at the most two, whereas most patients will need three, four bypass grafts, and there was no way with this access, we could get to the back of the heart. So we went back to the drawing board. And the drawing board was, well, here we are trying not to make operation through small hole, but we're trying to avoid a machine, uh, a technology which we know is damaging to the body. So can we do this operation by now opening the chest in a normal fashion, right? But then, doing the whole operation without using the machine on what we now call on the beating heart or off pump because the machine is not used. Now, I would like to show you a little video. I never had anybody fainting, but if there are people of, how do you say, a weak constitution, <laughs> perhaps close your eyes. But I can show you it's pretty straightforward. So when we do this, the first thing is we have to lift the heart, so to speak a little bit out of the chest, because usually the, the tip of the heart will be down there. And there are ways we have developed to do this. I, I won't go into that. But then you do the stitching. Now, the coronary of the heart are very small. It's about one or two millimeter in diameter. So it doesn't matter how good a surgeon you are, and probably are not one of the best anyway, you can't stitch it because it moves. So you have to find a way to keep at least a little bit of the heart where you're working still. And the idea came watching my auntie shortening a pair of my trousers. <laughs> and this is just the foot of a sewing machine. And as you can see, the rest of the heart moves, but these bits, and you will see in the next slide, doesn't move. 
And on top of that, we had to develop something else to keep the blood flowing when we do the surgery. And this is shown in the next slide. Here is the coronary is being opened. One of my assistants is occluding it. So I can introduce a little tube, which has got a hole in the middle. So then, then I can do the surgery without worrying about the heart being starved of oxygen, and most important, without blood coming on my face. And you can carry on doing all the stitching, and when you finish, before you tie the whole lot, you pull this string, the tube comes out, and you've virtually done a bypass graft. And you can repeat these three or four times, or as many times as you require. And as you can see, the heart now is being rotated by 180 degrees completely. Now, of course, as we do this, people said, well, this is just a fancy surgery, simply a, 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 an ego trip of the surgeon. So since we are an academic department, we, we trying to prove whether, or we went to see whether, we, we wanted to see whether there was any benefit or not to doing this operation. And what we did was uh, a very, a large study, what is called a randomized study. So you take a, a certain number of patients, the statistician will tell you how many, and then literally by a toss of a coin, providing the patient agree, you, you, you allocate them to have the operation either done with the machine or without the machine. And this is what we did, and uh, from all this work we concluded that by avoiding the machine there was some significant benefit like, for example, we would protect better certain organs like the kidney and the brain, patient bled less, there was less need for blood transfusion, chest infection, and there was also a saving of about 20% in cost of doing the operation. So as a result of that, we adopted this technique in Bristol. As you can see here, this was 1996, the red, when this technique was introduced. At that time, all the operations were done in blue with the machine, but as soon as we got better at it and other people learned the technique, we, we became more familiar and we adopted this technique more and more. And this is enough in terms of adult surgery, but let me tell you something now completely different, and it's pediatric. Now, when we operate on children, the first problem is, is a very small heart. Some of these children are born with terrible malformations. For example, they may have one of the artery in the heart completely missed. Let's say there is no artery going from the heart to the lungs. In this case, we do the operation and we use a piece of man-made tube to replace what is missed. The operation is very successful and our surgeons in Bristol are some of the best in the world. There is no question about that. The problem is the child will grow. But as the child grows, the tube doesn't grow. So you end up having several operations. You will hear after me, uh, the mother of one of our, our patients, in fact, has become a friend, really. This is Callum, one of the British Heart Foundation hero who's been operated four times already. And in between operations, he still finds the time to advertise second-hand furniture with me on behalf of the British <laughs> Art Foundation. So, Callan is really a hero, and you'll hear from his mother. So, the pediatric surgeons, uh, and this is not my work, this is work done by the pediatric surgeon here, Professor Caputo, who is actually, is a few months ago, three months ago, was awarded the first British Heart Foundation chair in pediatric cardiac surgery ever in the United Kingdom. And this is one of our basic scientists, uh, Professor Madedo. These guys are trying to use what is very uh, popular in a way nowadays, stem cell to mend the youngest heart. And here I have to say that I'm, I am extremely grateful amongst, every, or amongst all the charity who help us to the Linden Foundation and Jack and Audrey are here today, and those are the people who really believe in us in doing this when everybody thought it was a crazy idea. So what are we doing is this. As a pregnant mother, you, you're going to have a scan, and at a certain type of time of gestation, it's possible to diagnose if that baby's got some cardiac abnormality. If that is the case, you can get organized. 
Now you have to trust me with this. this. This particular child hasn't got one of the artery going from the heart to the lungs. So we get organized. When the baby is delivered, we take the placenta, the umbilical cord, and some blood, and all of this is delivered to the laboratory. In the laboratory, they will use this to isolate two types of cell. I'm not going into the details because it wouldn't be helpful to anybody. But from these two types of cell, they can then expand them, effectively turn them into million in the space of a few days. And then you can use this cell to build a biological conduit through a process which you can then implant it when you do the surgery. Now, this conduit is made of the cell of that particular baby who is going to have the operation. So the idea is, as the baby grows, so will the conduit. All the experimental work is almost completed. We're now arguing or fighting, whatever you would like to call it, with the uh, regulated authority. But I'm convinced that it won't be long before this could be actually done in clinical practice. So. What I've shown you are two examples of how surgery is trying to change things. But all of this is the results of innovation. But why do we need innovation in surgery? It's very simple. Right, think about this aeroplane, and sorry, sorry <coughs> to keep going with aeroplane, but this plane carries 400 people. If it was to crash, God forbid, it will be all over the news for weeks, no end. Now, the same, number, the same number of people die of sudden death every single day in the United Kingdom. That is the nature of the problem. And generally, this is the cause. This is a somebody uh, who died, the coronary of somebody who died. Now, in this big hole, blood was flowing freely. This little lip was attached here, and the smallest bits here was full of fat or cholesterol. Now, this is an unstable plug. This was probably somebody walk into his own business without any concern, suddenly this plaque rupture, blood flow here, mix with the fat, he makes a blood clot which is like a cork blocking that coronary, you get a heart attack, if you're unlucky you're dead straight away, if you're lucky you may make it to the hospital and if you're lucky you may have a heart operation or something like that. So it is a problem. Of course, one may say it's better to look at prevention than intervention, which you may say is easy because I'm near retirement, so I don't have to maintain any too much practice in terms of surgery. But prevention is really the key to this. And certainly, uh, if I can give you a piece of advice, try not to smoke, try not to eat all this junk, and the same for the high sugar drink because diabetes is becoming an epidemic. Uh, I was reading a couple of days ago, then half of the children in the United Kingdom or teenagers are obese. So it is a problem. And of course, and we've been discussing this this morning all day, uh, 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 use what is regarded the Mediterranean diet, but this is not much Mediterranean diet. This is just a sensible diet with plenty of fruit, vegetable, fish, a glass of red wine, no more than a glass, and some physical exercise, although I'm not expecting you to do what Ronald Fine did two or three years ago, then again, against my advice, climb Mount Everest <laughs> after three attempts. <laughs> but as they say, the most important thing, I'm afraid, is to choose your parents wisely. <laughs> and now, this means if your genes are good but, and you misbehave, you're not going to be protected. But if your genes are bad and you behave, it's less likely than you run into trouble. And now I have to make actually a confession. My mother always told me not to tell lies. And uh, my wife often say that um, I can be very economical with the truth. So the answer is I wasn't born in Siena. I've been telling you a lies, or I've been deceiving you, so to speak. In fact, I was born in a small village, some 20 miles south of Siena. I'll come to that in a minute, called Murlo. So in a way, I was never part of the intelligentsia or the aristocracy or whatever, which is born within the wall of the city. In fact, I was born in a village, so I was really part of the pleb. And this is the village where I was born, which is called Murlo. Now, in Murlo, there were, and there still are, no more than two or 300 families in total. 
My grandfather had the only coffee in the square. And as a young boy, as a teenager, I remember in the evening having, uh, listening to the old man playing card and drinking coffee or wine. Um, a gentleman used to say that in his vineyard there was a treasure. And of course, everybody was laughing after him. Eventually, the gentleman died of natural death. And within six months, a group of archaeologists from Princeton University come to the village and guess what? Start digging in the poor man field. And what they discover is one of the best evidence of the Etruscan civilization. Now, I'm not expecting you to know what the Etruscan are, because, but anyway, they preceded the Roman, 700 BC, and they were a very highly, um, how can I say, cultivated, educated, peaceful civilization. And this is one of the best pieces which was found during the excavation. Now, some friend from Turin, who was very much into genetics, they said, well, why don't we have a look at see whether the people in the village are still part of the Etruscan, or they got characteristics like the Etruscan. And um, so we said, we're going to take blood from the old family. I remember my mother and my father. Now, the village has always been away from the main line of communication. Uh, so there haven't been a great deal of invasion, raping, and, uh, or, or pillage. Uh, in fact, as I often say, my father married my mother, who was three, three, three doors down the same road. My grandfather, six doors down the same road. So there is an element of perhaps incestuous here, and that's probably why I got only one eye. <laughs> but th the bottom line is that we took all of this, we took this blood, and when they look at this blood, and look at this, they look only at... I'll come to this later, 34 genes, they concluded that it was almost a perfect match. They look at what is called mitochondrial DNA, but the bottom line was the, the DNA from the bone of the Etrusca was the same, more or less, to the blood taken from the people who had been living in the village ever since. And they concluded that there was some specific uh, uh, feature, like, for example, the shape of the nose, the distance of the eyes, and the feet. I never understood the feet. But... So we suddenly became very famous. And in fact, we made the front page of Le Figaro. <laughs> this, is, this is all true, believe me. And it, as you can see, the one of you who understand a bit of uh, French, he said, the Etruscan are amongst us. And they, in this particular uh, special edition of the Figaro, they try to show the similarity. This is a, a sculpture which was found in the excavation. And this, guess what, is somebody who is my best friend, who is two weeks older than me. And when we were at primary school, he was just sitting in the same table as me. As you can see, the difference is pretty striking. But perhaps even more so, these gentlemen. This guy owned the best pizzeria in the village. <laughs> now, look at him, right? You would think this is made up, right? But I can guarantee to you this is all real. This is, again, as a statue which was found in the excavation. And this is the guy who owned the pizzeria. And he's still <laughs> making pizza. So having done all of this, of course, there was a furthermore interest. Oh, where are the Etruscan coming from? Because nobody really knows, even now, there is still some controversy. Where are the Etruscan coming from? And there was an, an old history from a famous uh, a, a Roman philosopher, Herodotus. And Herodotus said, well, the Etruscan came from what is nowadays the northwest part of Turkey, Sparta. And they migrate, and that's how they ended up in the middle of Italy in Tuscany. And again, we made the front page. We made the New York Times this time. And indeed, the conclusion was that this is where it all originated, and then they migrate. And to do this, they went a step further. They went there in a small village near a place called Izmir in Turkey. They took some more blood sample. But this time, 15 years had passed from the 34. Remember, 34 genes, right? Now we were talking of more than half a million genes to show you how medicine has gone so fast uh, in a very, very short period of time. And the conclusion of all of this was, yes, the Etruscan really originated from a combination of people from this part, which is nowadays Turkey, who migrated in the central of Italy 
but much, much earlier, probably 3,000 years uh, BC. But the most important things which he came up was that they now sample, again, people in my village and in some other places where we knew that there was a strong component of Etruscan origin. And they concluded that in these three places, my village, Murlo, a place called Volterra, which some of you may actually know, and another place near Arezzo, in this short triangle, there was still a very high concentration of people which had genetic origin from the, the, the real Etruscan. So I'm afraid Leonardo is not an ancestor of mine, that's for sure. But this gentleman here definitely is, because he was born in one of these small villages, which is 100% Etruscan. OK, it's not Leonardo, but he didn't do so bad. <laughs> He didn't do so bad either. Now, why am I showing all of this? Is it because I'm just here to sort of boost my origin or just tell you a bit of a joke? No. There is a reason behind this, because first of all, I want to show you how medicine has evolved or is very, very fast evolving. But also because we got one of these examples here in Bristol. In the early 90s, somebody very foresighted a Professor Golden decided to take, uh, let's call it a database for all the pregnant women and the children who were born in, in the Bristol area. And this is now called the children of the 90. Now, these children, of course, have grown and now they've got their own children, so we now got the children of the children of the 90. The bottom line is then there are almost 15,000 families of which these people knows absolutely everything, which can be used mainly to improve the health of the future generation. And this is the example which I've used to show you how really medicine is evolving and fast going uh, as, as we are indeed talking. So I think we never had it so good. I really truly believe we never had it so good. And what we've been, in a way, celebrating here today, the National Institute of Health Research, which is awarded uh, at Bristol, a biomedical research center at the tune of 21 million, is an example of how really we have been in power to do even better work than we're doing until now. And this is what a BRC is, which stands for Biomedical Research Center. The cardiovascular is only a small component there are people from mental health, nutrition, lifestyle, perinatal and reproductive health, and surgical innovation, as you will hear in a bit. And all of this is like, uh, how can I say, gelled together by the clever people, the people who look at the genomic and they can look at thousands and thousands of people and tell us not only what we're doing wrong, but also what we should be doing in order to make things better. These are the main aim of what we are trying to achieve. We, we want to translate this research into something very concrete, which is benefit for the patient and possibly for the NHS, which is in need of cash. There is no question. So if we can save any money by what we do, it will be very beneficial. But most important, we also want to train the next generation of scientists and of clinicians. And these are the so-called PI, uh, the, the main people who are leading, uh, I hope I haven't forgotten anybody, but if I have, please do take my apologies. But these are the people who are leading, but behind these people there is an awful lot of other people who do the work in the laboratory, in the operating theatres, and in the hospital ward every day of the week. This is just a small snapshot of some of the cardiovascular, but it's not exaggeration to say there are hundreds of people doing this work. So I think uh, we are very honored and privileged in a way to be given this recognition, which to a certain extent is something that I think the people of Bristol should also be uh, very, very proud. And uh, uh, from my part, I'm the guy who goes around telling the story. I don't do much of the work nowadays, uh, but it is a real privilege to work with these people and I genuinely think the best really is yet to come. Thank you.
Um, hi there. Um, God, there's a lot of you. <laughs> so, um, so thank you very much for the invite to come and speak today. Um, I am a mum of um, three children. Um, my eldest is 15 and about to do her GCSEs. And then I have Callum, who's um, nearly 12, and then Oliver, who's eight. So Callum um, was our second child, and we're very excited to, to be adding to our family. I had a very normal pregnancy, and at my 20-week scan, I was told everything was fine. And so I had no idea what was going to evolve um, once he arrived. I had a really good delivery, and um, I thought I was going to go home the same day. Um, apart from when they did the um, baby check at six hours old, um, the doctor that did that said they could hear some strange different sounds in his heart, but it was really quite common and he'd probably be fine by the next day. So stay in overnight and you should be able to go home. Um, the next day came and unfortunately those sounds were still there and we were then um, told that he would, should have a heart scan just to check what was going on. Um, and, you know, when several different people come in and do a heart scan on your child, you begin to become quite concerned. Um, and I will never forget, we are failing to find some major components of his heart was how the news was broken to us. And obviously at that point, your world falls apart. So I was transferred with Callum from Southmead Hospital um, to um, the Children's Hospital. And that's where our cardiac story began, really. Um, so Callum had his first surgery when he was 10 days old. Um, and he has had now three further surgeries, one when he was four, again when he was six, and his last surgery was May last year when he was 11. Um, and as Gianni mentioned, the, the reason for those repeat surgeries have been because he has an artificial tube that makes up um, his pulmonary artery, which takes blood from his heart to his lungs, and therefore um, that hasn't grown with him. So as he's grown, then he's had to have that replaced. And obviously it's major surgery. It's opening up his chest each time, going through intensive care, um, big, big operations. Now, when we knew that Callum would need this last surgery, Callum, um, having done a few things for the British Heart Foundation in the past, um, actually said, I want to do something. I want people to know what it's like to have a special heart. And this very much was his idea to produce a series of videos that documented the story up to and through his surgery and beyond. Um, and I'm going to just show you, this is the, the day of his surgery. So there are some, so on the uh, British Heart Foundation website, there's a series of videos which show him before talking about his surgery, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a, the day of his surgery. Um, it does show some quite, well, not graphic, but it shows so, um, the operating theatre and also intensive care. So just again, if you're squeamish, close your eyes. Um, but um, this just shows what a child has to go through um, when they have surgery. Dear Callum, sending you much of love and hugs. I'll be thinking of you next week. You've got a special little heart, fixed heart. And then what are you going to be able to do? Football. Football. Good luck, it says. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three, yeah, we go. Yeah. Awesome. Can you remember when we had that really hot day and we all went flying in the plane? You, Oliver, Eleanor, Mummy, and me. We went to a circle. And we're flying in that little plane and we're all the way up into the sky. Yeah, you can see people then. Yeah. You're such a sun day that day. Ah, that's great. Yeah. So, see you later. 
Peter, I hope it's not too long a day. Let's keep it nice and safe. We will, that's why we're here. Thank you. I mean, we managed to do the things that we wanted to do. Um, it took a long time because mm. it was just very stuck and all the tissues were very fragile. And, um, but, you know, I was quite happy at the end. The, the valve is working much better. It's not leaking very, very mild. Yeah. We do appreciate yeah. it very much. Oh, we'll, we're still, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, thank we still uh, need to keep an eye on that. Okay. Yeah. 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 The worst part is done. Yeah. So as you can see, you know, what a child has to go through and obviously an adult as well is huge. And I mean, obviously the recovery from a surgery like that takes quite a long time. Now I would say Callum is now, he had his surgery the end of May and I would say he's now getting back to, to where he should be. And emotionally, uh, at 11 years old, it really hits really hard as well. Um, and so we as a family are just so aware of how important research is. I mean, if Callum had been born 10 years earlier, then he may well not be here now. So advances are continually improving. So the outcome for children is much better now having cardiac surgery. But obviously, if things like the stem cell um, research and things like that move forward and enable children not to need for open heart surgeries by the time they're 12, then obviously that is a huge, huge, you know, improvement and, and you know, just makes their lives and, and family life so much easier. I mean, it doesn't just impact on Callum, it impacts on the whole family. And we already know that unfortunately he has a, a you know, a, a valve that will need replacing. So there will be at least one more surgery to come. So um, we just hope that there's continuing advances and you know, maybe there'll be a keyhole way of doing things or something. But we can only, we just feel very grateful we live in Bristol. We always said after Callum was born, we would never move away unless obviously his surgeon moves away and we may have to tr track him down. <laughs> so, um, but thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. So I just wanted to add, really, um, another tribute to Nicola, to Callum, and to the Heart Institute, and just to say, isn't it incredible what can be achieved with advances in surgery? And just to say thank you for sharing that very brave and honest, um, and please thank Callum when you go home later. I wanted to add that. Because 
it really is incredible what has changed since, even in my time, since I've been training. I trained in Bristol, and in the 1980s when I was training, things that were thought to be absolutely impossible, we see nowadays all the time in everyday practice. So when I was um, here in the training in the 1980s, you literally would, we'd have older people come in with severe abdominal problems, I'm an abdominal surgeon, peritonitis, or something like a ruptured aneurysm, the big blood vessel in their back of their abdomen. And we'd either decide we just can't get these people through an operation, they'd never survive, or sometimes we'd have to operate really not knowing what we were going to find. But nowadays, they will come in, we will immediately do a contrast-enhanced CT scan, we'll get an accurate diagnosis, we'll talk to the intensive care unit, we'll go to theatre, maybe use keyhole surgery, move them to the intensive care unit, they go through an enhanced recovery protocol afters with physiotherapists and dietitians, and the whole thing's coordinated care with team working across the whole lot, and they survive and get out of hospital. It really is amazing. Innovation and advances in healthcare are absolutely critical to surgery and what it can do for us. The thing is, the challenge with innovation, though, is that inevitably there will be things that go wrong. There will be times when it fails. And it's been said, Brenny Brown said, who's this amazing woman who's um, written some great books and given one of the most viewed TED Talks, she said that there's no innovation or creativity without failure. And in surgery and in medicine, we learn so much from making mistakes. I mean, it's true, we learn so much when things go wrong. But of course, who wants to be the person, the patient, in whom things go wrong? And it's really challenging to do surgical research with human beings as the experiment. And so the question, one of the questions in the Bristol Biomedical Research Centre is how to do that and do it well. So in medicine, where you have drugs, new drugs, it's relatively straightforward. There are clear regulations clear processes in place, clear governance systems for introducing and testing new drugs. They're there, there's a lot of red tape, but we know how to do it, and at the end of the day, it does help protect patients, protect doctors and nurses, and protect the hospitals. In fact, if I went up to the medical school now, and if I mixed up some rhubarb and some polyjuice potion and made a new tablet, and then walked down St. Michael's Hill and decided to give it to a patient in the Royal Infirmary, I would be struck off, full stop. Even if that little tablet didn't do any harm, I would be struck off the general medical register, just like that. But it's actually in surgery, to change operations, to innovate, is much less well regulated. It's really difficult for surgeons to know whether they try and put something through research ethics, whether they get a new procedure committee to approve a new technique, or whether they just do it. There's no real strict policies. It's also really difficult to know when a surgeon is sufficiently credentialed to, and experienced enough to undertake new techniques. There's no sort of regulations around that. And the whole thing about reporting the outcomes of surgery is very challenging. So if we do something new in Bristol, if I could go and do something new and say it went wrong, I would learn from that, but there's absolutely no sort of mandate for me to tell anyone else about that. So the same thing could happen in Belfast. The same operation could be done, it could go wrong again, and that, and that surgeon wouldn't know that we'd made the same mistake in Bristol, and it could be repeated in Birmingham, in Bradford, in Bournemouth. And effectively, no one learns from each other's mistakes. There's no mandated way of reporting and learning when the things go wrong, which is completely different to drugs. Once drugs have been licensed and approved with all that testing, there's even a system then when they're everyday use, the yellow card system that we use. So if you get a rare problem with, with drugs in the long term, a doctor fills in the yellow card and eventually they pile up and someone spots the problem. But in surgery, all these things really need sorting out. And in the Biomedical Research Center, in the surgical innovation theme, that's one of the things we're trying to address. We're trying to address how to transparently and safely and efficiently and ethically bring in new surgical procedures. 
and we're going to try and work out how to best talk to people about this. Should we tell patients, this is the first time I've ever done this operation? Should it be the surgeon that says that? Who should tell the patient? Maybe it should be not the surgeon, because we do suffer, as you would have heard from Johnny, this terrible thing called optimism bias. You have to if you're going to be a surgeon. You have to you know, be able to act on your decisions. But equally, you want informed consent to be truly informed. And so we want to answer those sort of questions. And we're also going to try and look at when to stop surgical procedures that aren't working successfully. When do you decide to abandon a procedure? And how on earth do we sort out this business of outcome reporting? How do we learn from each other's mistakes? How do we report when problems go wrong without causing trouble, but really optimizing the healthcare learning from those sort of situations? Those are the sort of things we are going to tackle. And this evening, we're really interested as we move into the discussion now to hear your views on those things. Thank you. <laughs>